so great to be with you today. It's always fun, too, when you have a release of a new book and you have the author of that brand new book joining you on the program. Today, August 11th, is the release date for a brand new book entitled You're Not Enough and That's Okay, Escaping the Toxic Culture of Self-Love. The author is Allie Beth Stuckey. She is host of the Blaze Media show Relatable and author, of course, of this new book, You're Not Enough and That's Okay. And I'm so excited to welcome Allie Beth to Jimmy at the Crossroads right now. Welcome to the show and congrats on the new book. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. So I appreciate the time. And we have a few things I want to dive into. And before we get to specifics of the book, which is a fascinating premise, and I really think that you you hit the nail on the head on some things going on in our culture and society right now that we really need to have a conversation about. But first, one thing that I'm very interested in, and I know you are, having begun several years ago your own political activism on a blog, The Conservative Millennial. You and I share a similar passion about engaging young people in the political process, and especially with COVID-19 right now, the ongoing fights over the role of government in addressing a crisis like this. I'm curious where you think our millennial generation is at politically in 2020, Ali Beth. I think we're probably in general in the same place that we were before. Now, it might be a little bit different because, of course, we're four, four years older than we were in 2016. I mean, everyone who has seen the studies in the polls know that millennials are in general a liberal generation, not quite as liberal as the generation coming up after us, but a lot of that is typical of people just in our age group. Now, as we've gotten older, the oldest millennials are almost 40. We've got mortgages, we're paying taxes. A lot of us have kids. So we're thinking about the future. We're thinking about our responsibilities. We're thinking about how much money comes out of our paycheck. We're also thinking, especially right now, about what education is going to look like, especially um, just in the coming months and in the coming years for our children. And so what I'm hoping is, is that as millennials get older, as we take on these responsibilities, as we have kids and are thinking about the future generations, that we will see the negative effects of authoritarianism and the threat that they pose to our kids, to our families, and to our well-being and our livelihood. Hopefully, people have woken up um, to the destructive nature and the totalitarian nature in a lot of ways of some of these democratic politicians and policies. And so that's what I can hope for. I haven't seen the studies proving that. That's just kind of my perspective and my take from the conversations that I've had. My sense from research that I've done, and I've spoken about this quite a bit, and I for a few years ran a think tank focused on the millennial generation, my sense is that about 55% of millennials are what I call politically marginal millennials, meaning that they're not hard left, that is solidly left or solidly right. right. They're essentially up for grabs. They are persuadables. And the problem mm -hmm. is that we often find ourselves in our camps on the right or the left and aren't playing as much to try to win over the center group, that 55% who are up for grabs, who indeed could come along to to the conservative side if they heard that right message. And maybe now, as you're getting at, might be providing us with an opportunity. Yes, absolutely. And I think that conservatives, as always, we have a lot to go up against because you've got the people in the middle who you like, who, like you said, are persuadable, but are constantly getting bombarded by either overt leftist messages or more subtle leftist messages. As an evangelical Christian, I've seen kind of leftist ideology and theology seep its way into the church in the form of what sounds like something that is biblical and true, but actually underneath it is really just kind of the same kind of Marxist ideology that we are seeing in more explicit ways in the far left. And unfortunately, it's not just damaging people's theology, uh, but it is also damaging people's politics and it's pushing them over. And so I think that something that conservatives have to do is be willing to make the moral case for conservatism, which I think we have the easiest time ever in history to be able to do that right now when it comes to abortion, when it comes to some of these lockdown policies, when it comes to things like defunding the police, when it comes to education for our kids, uh, Democrats are just on, in most of these cases, on the immoral and the damaging and the destructive side of these issues. And so conservatives, we have a case to make right now that conservatism isn't just anti-leftism, but it's pro-people. It is pro-compassionate. It's pro-opportunity. It's pro-liberty and freedom. It's pro-family. 
all the things that a lot of young parents, a lot of young people really want for themselves and for their families. And so we need to be out there making that case. Yeah, I think that's very true. Again, we're talking with Allie Beth Stuckey, author of the brand new book, You're Not Enough and That's Okay, Escaping the Toxic Culture of Self-Love. And I think this actually ties into our discussion about millennials because so much of what's going on in our society today is impacting our politics in very significant ways. And when you have this focus on sort of this me, me, me culture of let's just focus on myself and not what good I'm bringing to society or also looking at, as you talk about, faith and the role that, that Jesus should play in our society and in our day-to-day -day lives, I think that so much of what we're talking about in terms of this seemingly left-wing viewpoint of millennials goes to a lot of what you're talking about in the book. So let's shift over to You're Not Enough and That's Okay. Tell us what the book about is about and maybe tease a little bit about how our discussion in the last few moments ties into what you've written about in the new book published today. It absolutely ties in. So the point of this book, You're Not Enough and That's Okay, Escaping the Toxic Culture of Self-Love, it combats the lie that I would say, especially a lot of young women here, both in and outside of the church, both conservative and liberal, that you are sufficient for your own truth, your own purpose, your own fulfillment, your own satisfaction, your own wisdom, whatever it is, you are enough for those things. Basically, the idea that you are your own God, you are the own your own arbiter of truth and purpose and fulfillment and all of these things. And in order to come into your own, in order to be successful and happy, all you have to do is love yourself. All you have to do is have high self-esteem and you just have to do what makes you happy. You have to love yourself and like yourself before you can love and like and serve other people. And this is a very liberating and fulfilling sounding form of narcissism. It's what I call in my book, trendy narcissism, yes. this idea that the world centers on you and that anything that commands that you sacrifice the things that you want for the good of other people should be rejected in this kind of mindset. So the book goes through five myths. Uh, one of the myths, you're enough, you're perfect the way you are, you determine your own truth, you're entitled to your dreams, you have to love yourself before you love other people. And we shift away from those, not by saying, hey, you should hate yourself or that you should just wallow into your insecurities and self-loathing, but actually take your eyes off of yourself and put your eyes, this is a Christian book, put your eyes on the God who created you, who gives you truth and purpose and the fulfillment that you are trying and failing to find inside yourself. Yeah, I want to go to one thing you said, your own truth. We constantly hear this idea, my truth, what's your truth? That sets us along the wrong path when we start to think, oh, you know, truth can be subjective or truth is subjective. And that kind of language underscores this idea that we should be focusing on ourselves as a society, but not in a way that is, look, I'm an individualist. I'm a conservative. I'm a small government right. guy. I believe that the individual is, is fundamental to our society, but at the same time, individuals have responsibilities to our society. And if you're not believing that there is one solid truth and instead it's just your truth and my truth, you can't really advance things tr on, a, on a true level, I think. Yes, there's a difference certainly between individualism, which you and I believe the importance of taking responsibility for your own actions, providing for yourself, working hard, providing for your family yes. and all of that. Of course, we believe in individualism in that way. What we reject is this idea of relativism and subjectivism that you and I determine our own truth, our own morality, that you can't tell me uh, that what I think is wrong because it is, it's, it's my truth. We reject that because we realize that that kind of society that is built on basically a bunch of mini gods, people who worship themselves and go to themselves for truth is just, it doesn't function. We have to agree on some sort of value system, on some sort of morality that binds us together and allows us to function. And we see this kind of uh, my truth and your truth come out in things like abortion, for example, the idea of autonomy, trumping anything else, trumping morality, trumping what's right and wrong, trumping even the good of someone else is something that we as a relativistic society decided that we are going to worship. That because we worship ourselves, 
we are even willing to sacrifice the life of an unborn child on the altar of convenience because we have decided we determine what's right and wrong for ourselves and no objective morality can tell us any differently and so this idea of my truth that i talk about from a theological and a philosophical perspective really does have practical political and cultural tangible implications um, when we are not beholden to any kind of objective morality unfortunately we're willing to compromise anything in the name of doing us yeah, well, and something else to it. In this cultural moment, Allie Beth, what we're seeing across the country, and we have for months now, has been riots and destruction of property, attacks against other individuals. When you don't have one common notion of what is right and what is wrong, where you're not bound together by the idea that individuals do have unalienable rights, including property, right. including the right to life, and of course, the mm -hmm. pursuit of happiness and so forth. If you diminish that, then you have nothing that you can really be be working towards protecting and ensuring and guaranteeing for one individual and another. Instead, people can just go destroy property and you don't exactly. bat an eye because the cause is good, supposedly. Exactly. And it influences our idea of what justice is. We have a lot of people crying out for justice right now, and we don't seem to agree on what that means. Apparently, mm. it doesn't just mean due process. It doesn't mean no. equality under the eyes of the law. For some people who are crying out about justice, it's not about even standards at all. It's actually about unequal standards. And it's actually about showing favor to one group based on, uh, you know, either real or perceived oppression and trying to hold back another group due to, um, you know, their perceived collective guilt, which is, you know, it's just a, another form of Marxism that is taking root on the cultural and political level. Well, that's not actually justice in any real meaning of the word. And yet we have people crying out for justice, not based on fact, not based on any solid substantive philosophy, but based on what feels good, based right. on a desire for vengeance and retribution. And so again, when you don't have any kind of real objective truth and reality that is anchoring you, we can cry out for things like justice and mean a million different things, which again, a society cannot function that way. Yeah, if you're not grounded in something, then you can go with whatever the passions direct you, wherever, wherever the passions direct you. And I think it's such an important point. Once again, we're talking with Ali Beth Stuck. He's author of the brand new book, Out Today, You're Not Enough, and That's Okay, Escaping the Toxic Culture of Self-Love. One more question for you before I know we got to let you go, Ali Beth. Uh, and that is, in your book, because it's written... You say, say the title, you're not enough, and that's okay, escaping the culture, uh, the toxic culture of self-love. So one might think, okay, is this a self-improvement book? Is this about an individual? Is this about a and, and focus, refocusing yourself? Or is this about society and the culture and politics? Is it an intersection of all of those kinds of things? How do you approach this new book, Ali Beth? So it's both personal and political with an emphasis certainly on the personal. I believe yes. if there's any kind of societal change, any kind of hope for the betterment of a collective, it starts within the heart. Now, that's not the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book is not to change people's politics, but to reorient themselves or refocus their eyes away from self-obsession and this relentless self-focus, which actually leads to unfulfillment and unsatisfaction and heartbreak and a dead end, as I personally have experienced myself, and taking their eyes off of themselves and looking to their creator. The, uh, the fact that you're not enough is actually very good news, that God made us not enough. He made us to depend on him for salvation and sanctification and wisdom and strength. And so we get to relinquish the responsibility and the burden that was never ours in the first place. We get to go to the word of God for our objective truth, for our morality, for our purpose. And we get to look to the cross of Jesus Christ for our worth and our value. And that takes a huge weight off of us. And that's why it's very good news that you are not enough. And one thing that we were just talking about is the idea of my truth and how that is bringing people to follow passions of the moment, to destroy property, to have no concern and show no concern for other individual rights. And that comes from not focusing on these things as an individual. So if your book is, as it is, oriented towards helping to get an individual to refocus on what's right, what really is true and what really is important in this, how 
we view ourselves and our relationship to others, that I yes. do think is the key to improving society. Yes, I totally agree with you. And not going to the opposite of self-love is not um, self-loathing and self-deprecation, but right. a form of self-forgetfulness, valuing sacrifice, valuing love of others and putting others and principles before yourself and your whims and your feelings of the moment. Yes, I do think society would be much better if that was um, all of our value systems. Yeah, well put. Let's put the book up on the screen one more time. Just out today, You're Not Enough, and That's Okay, Escaping the Toxic Culture of Self-Love. The author, Ali Beth Stuckey, host of the Relatable Podcast at The Blaze Media. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Congratulations on the book, and best of luck with it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Once again, Ali Beth Stuckey joining us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. And it is such an important point. When we're looking at society today and the destruction and the chaos that we have been seeing, the rioting in the streets, the lack of concern for other individuals and their rights, it comes from this selfish attitude of me, 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 to the point of not where your individualism and it's individualism and you're focused on actually protecting your individual rights, but it's to the point of, I deserve this and therefore I will take it. I'm feeling this way so I want you to feel bad too because I'm going to destroy your property or disrupt your rally or start beating on you, shut down your business, whatever it is. That comes from this idea of a very selfish place. And so I think it really is profound to be seeing what what Ali Beth Stuckey is doing in the book and, and really looking at reformulating how we look at ourselves and society and how central that absolutely is to improving our society, to improving our nation, to bettering our politics. It's fundamental to a free society. It's not just the notion of individual rights and liberty, but also individual personal responsibility. And that's going by the wayside. Because of the way society is looking at these things, as Ali Beth Stuckey so eloquently discussed and talks about in her book, You're Not Enough and That's Okay. Thanks for watching this clip from Jimmy at the Crossroads. You do not want to miss a minute of engaging, intelligent talk. Subscribe today to the Jimmy at the Crossroads YouTube channel and you'll be sure to catch our live broadcast. I appreciate your support. I got Jimmy at the crossroads Making sense out of no one No sense Yeah! <laughs>